may be seated. Praise the Lord. He is good. Hallelujah. Why don't you turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to continue a series we began a while back called I Am. I Am. And in the context of the I Am, for those of you that have not been with us at the beginning of this series, Moses was born. There was an edict that went out in all of Egypt that all of the firstborn children, all of the children of a certain age would be killed, massacred, slaughtered. And so Moses' mother, being a good mother, decided that she would do her best to hide her child. So she did that. She formed a a basket, a waterproof basket, put him in, put him in the river, in a place where the Pharaoh's daughter would likely go. She would see him and would save him. That was her hope. And sure enough, exactly as she had desired, exactly as she thought came to pass, the Pharaoh's daughter saw him. Uh, it It was a miracle that took place that her heart, brought him or desired to have him for her own. And she allowed Moses, Moses' sister was there guarding or watching over the events of that child. And Moses was given to his mother, his, his uh, birth mother, for her to take care of him until such time as the Pharaoh's daughter could take him for her own. During that time, I believe that as any mother would do, she imparted to Moses this truth, God has spared you for a purpose. God has a purpose for you. And I want you to know this morning, regardless of whether you've been spared or not, God has a purpose for your life. A divine purpose. Our God is a strategic God, and he has a strategic plan for your life. She raised Moses, and I believe she raised Moses with the understanding that God has spared you for a reason, and and during that time, brief time as it may have been, she taught him the truth of God. Then he was placed in Pharaoh's home. He lived in the best house, ate the best foods, went to the best schools. He had the best of the best of the best. And still with all of that, he knew within his heart that God had called him for a purpose. Never give up on what God has called you to do. Never give up on God's destiny in your life. Never give up. The the, uh, circumstances surrounding your life don't dictate God's will for your life. The limitations of your own abilities don't limit God's will and purpose for your life. So Moses, knowing that he was the leader or deliverer of Pharaoh, brought out for a purpose, trained for a purpose, one day was out and about, and I think he was probably looking over his kingdom, the kingdom of the Jews, and and knowing one day he's going to lead them out. and, And so as he was walking about this, one day he saw an Egyptian slave master abusing one of the Jewish people, men. And, and anger rose up within his heart. I don't believe it was righteous indignation or righteous anger. I think his emotions got the best of him. Can I tell you this? God always has a time. And God always has a season. And any time you try to help God out, you're going to fail. God doesn't need your help. All God needs is your willingness to walk according to his will and purpose. So he killed the Egyptian. He liberated that Jewish man and thought, okay, I've done it now, now my destiny has come, and I'm going to be known and, and, and hailed as a hero of all of, the, of Judaism. So the next day he walks out, and he walks among the Jews, strutting his stuff, he's somebody, and they said, who do you think you are? You killed an Egyptian, are you going to kill one of us now? And then he found out that the Pharaoh was out to get him. The Pharaoh had heard about this as well. And the Pharaoh decided, we're going to kill that boy. We're going to kill him. So Moses did what most faith-filled people who are full of God did. He ran away. He ran away from the Pharaoh's home, Pharaoh's food, Pharaoh's education. He ran away into the wilderness. In other words, he exiled himself into the wilderness. There he stayed for 40 years, tending sheep, wasn't even his own sheep. He had nothing. What he learned in that 40 years is I am an utter failure. God had a plan for my life, and I failed. God had a purpose for my life, and I failed. God had a, 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 a season for my life, and I failed. And now, and it wasn't so much that I think he gave up on himself, though he did. I think he believed God gave up on him, too. Let me let you in on a little secret. God will never give up on you. Nothing you can do, nothing you can say, nothing you can be or not do or not say or not be that God will ever say, I give up on you. 
In fact, a youth pastor friend of mine used to say, God would rather hear you say, I'm sorry a thousand times than to ever hear you say, I quit one time. Moses out there in the wilderness is wandering around and as he'd done every day, it was just an ordinary day. How many of you know it's not extraordinary days that God does the most, but just ordinary days? Just living your life. Just doing what you always do and all of a sudden, you have an encounter with God. Something that changes your life. Something that changes your, your faith. Something that changes your very being. And Moses in the wilderness there doing what he'd always done came upon a sight he had never seen before. The sight that he had, had never seen before wasn't a burning bush. I suspect Moses had burned many bushes. But there was something different about this one. Because it was a bush that was, was not consuming the bush. Or the fire was not consuming the bush. Can I tell you what that fire was? That was a fire of the Holy Spirit. Wasn't consuming, wasn't destroying that bush. And the Bible says Moses looked at it and he turned around and says, now I'm going to turn back and look at it again. And he turned back and there it was. It continued. And from that burning bush, God spoke to Moses. And God said to Moses, I've called you. God, in essence, said, Moses, I still have that same destiny for your life. And Moses said, I can't. I'm a failure. And so God said to Moses again, I've called you to your eternal, eternal destiny. And Moses said, I can't. I killed a man. And God said a third time, I've called you to your destiny. And Moses said, I am nothing. And then the Bible says that God's anger was kindled against Moses. Now, there's one thing I've learned in my life. I don't want to make God mad. Anybody ever made God mad? I've made God mad. I've heard that rebuke in my life before. And so, in essence, what God said is, you can do what I have called you to do because I am with you. And so, so Moses said, okay, God, I did it on my authority. I did it under the covering of the Pharaoh. Now, if I go back to those people who will remember me when I go back and remember my failure, in what authority or in whose authority am I say, to say I'm going into? I'm not going in my own because they know I'm a failure. I'm a nothing. I'm worthless. Whose authority am I going in? And God told him something that ought to ring within our spirit. He said, you tell them, I am sent you. I am. And that settles it. I am. I am what? I am the essence of everything. I am the beginning of everything. I am the life of everything. I am sent you. Now you say, well, Pastor Steve, why is it important that we know the I am? Why is it important that we know that authority? Because only when I know the I am will I know who I am. You see, my value is not found in myself. My value is not found in my intellect. My value is not found in where I came from or whose family I was born into. My value doesn't come by anything that I have the natural ability to do. My value comes through Jesus Christ. Who I am is defined by Jesus Christ. I am you tell them, I am sent you. And so Moses said, I can't talk to people. Many theologians think he had some kind of, of, of impediment, speech impediment. And, and I can't speak. I, I don't have the ability to, to speak. And so God said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of that too. I'll send someone with you who will speak for you. And don't you know that when you, when you look at the scripture and you read about Moses' encounter with the Pharaoh, the one not the one who wanted to kill him, but the one who could kill him. His interaction, you never hear Aaron say a word. You only hear Moses. Moses speaks. Moses speaks. Moses speaks. So apparently between the wilderness and Egypt, God had changed who Moses was. And the minute you have an encounter with God, the minute you understand that God is the I am and in the I am defines who I am, then something begins to change. And you become not what you were, you become what God is making you to be. You, become, you come to that place where you begin to fulfill the destiny that God has called you to. You see, the issue is not your problem. We all have problems. Some of us create our own problems. The issue is not the problem or the challenge you may face today. The issue is, where do you look for the answers to those problems? Where do you look to find the solutions to the things that you're dealing with? Someone once said, my focus is not on the flood, 
that surrounds me. My focus is on the God who surrounds the flood. You see, God is bigger than your problem. God is bigger than the issues that you deal with in your life. God was bigger than Moses, and God is bigger than you. So he is the I am. And in our series, we're, we're saying God, Jehovah, and in this case, we're saying Jehovah Jireh. Now, now we probably have some context of what Jireh means, but, but where did we get Jehovah? Well, the essence of the origin of the word Jehovah really is a mystery to most Bible scholars. In fact, the Jews in the law would never consider calling God by his name. In fact, what they would call God is Yahweh, but they don't have vowels in their alphabet, what they would or in the in their in their language. What they would say is Y, excuse me, Y W Y. Is it on the screen? <laughs> Y-W-H-W. We pronounce it Yahweh. Say it with me. Yahweh. And from Yahweh, we have come to discover and embrace the name Jehovah. Now, Yahweh means something. Yahweh literally means he brings into life whatever exists. In essence, Jehovah means the essence of life. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he gives you life and he gives that more abundant. Jesus said, I've come that you might have. He didn't say, I come that you might exist. He didn't say, I've come that you might just get by. Just, just get through another day. Just get through another season. Just get through another year. Just get through 2019 so I get into 2020. Hallelujah. No, that's not the purpose of God. That's not the plan of God for your life. Jesus came that you might have life to its fullest, to its most abundant. People's lives in the world and even in the church, people are satisfied with simply existing, breathing, getting up in the morning, maybe have a little breakfast, go to work or school, have lunch, get off, go home, eat dinner, go to bed, and start the routine all over again. But that's not God's intention for your life. God's intention for your life is to live the most full life that is ever possible to be lived. If anybody ever tells you that living a Christian life is boring, I got news for you. They don't know what they're talking about. Christian life is the most, true Christian life, a true follower of Jesus Christ, has the most satisfying and energetic, that life is, is an adventure. Every day you awaken knowing that God is walking with you. An ordinary day, you find that whatever your need is, God is providing that need. Every prayer that you pray, you pray it with an expectation that you're going to hear the answer from God. Every door that is closed, you know you don't have to break the door down. God's going to open that door or a better door in your life. That's an adventure. It's an adventure knowing that the creator of all of humanity, all of life, will speak into your heart and speak into your spirit. We can say that the name Jehovah literally means full of life. So that I can say this morning, I am full of life. I am living life to its very fullest. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, and I'll only refer to verse 19, it says, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge cannot comprehend the depth to which God loves us. He said that you may be filled with a measure of all of the fullness of God. Now, how many of you know what all of the fullness of God is. We can't comprehend the fullness of God. We can't comprehend the vastness of who God is. Yet the word says, all of God is given into your life so that you can live to its fullest. Jehovah thus implies, God brings into life. I think most of us could testify that before we became born again, we were living a walking death. No life. It was existence, it was getting by. And how many of us know that even when we thought we were living, and even though we thought it was a good life, when we came to know Christ, we realized it was a nothing life. Now we're living the fullness of life. Now we've experienced the fullness of God. Jehovah Jireh means if God sees, God will see to it. If God sees, God will see to it. Now, let's read Genesis chapter 22. We're looking at Abraham's life. We move from Moses now to Abraham, Jehovah Jireh. This is the place, the first place in the Bible where we find the term Jehovah Jireh. 
And I want to read, and I, I only have just a couple of minutes here, so we're only going to get an introduction to this message. We'll continue it next Sunday. But I want us to read Genesis chapter 22, and I'm going to point out a couple of things as we go through here that I think will encourage your heart and, and will help us get an insight into Jehovah Jireh. Genesis chapter 22, beginning with verse 4. On the third day. Now, let me stop. We're going to find some really interesting parallels between Abraham and Isaac and between God and Jesus. Isn't it interesting that this, this, this story begins on the third day? What happened on the third day with Jesus? Rose from the dead. It was the third day that he rose from the dead. Okay, keep that in mind. On the third day, Abraham looked up. Don and I, when we were in uh, some place we were traveling to, uh, it was in uh, Charlotte, I believe, or maybe uh, uh, Calgary. Uh, Donna, we were walking to this, it was Calgary, we were walking to this place, and Donna was walking, and there was a planter there, and it came out to a point like this, almost about that, that pointed. And we're walking by, and I'm walking by, and I see it, and I walk around it like this. Donna doesn't see it, and she walks right into it and falls splat on the ground. I mean, I mean hard. And I just kept walking until I realized that she wasn't walking with me, and I looked back, and she's laying on the ground. And I could tell it was in pain. And so I, I immediately rushed to her side, but before I got to her, there were two ladies, a man and two ladies already there, two ladies that were registered nurses, just happened to be right there at the time. And a man, the man was a homeless man. And I think of all the compassion of the three that were there, he showed the greatest of compassion. And so we, we knelt down, and, and there was some, there was some uh, minor injuries. I don't think it felt minor to Donna, but minor injuries. And, and so as we were talking about this before, I said, how in the world did you not see that? And she said, I was looking up. And we noticed that there's a difference between Donna and me. When I walk, I look down. <laughs> when she walks, she looks up. <laughs> so as a team, we work real well together. The only thing is we need to lock arms together. So we can... <laughs> and so as, as, as Abraham is going on this journey that he's about to go on, what does the Bible say? He looks up. He looks up. What is he doing? He's raising his expectations. He, he, he's looking. The Bible says, lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. Lift, lift up your head, lift up your eyes. The answer is on the way. So he, the Bible says, he looked up and he saw the place in the distance, the mountain of the Lord. And he said to his servants, and, and this is another thing to keep in mind. Abraham has been commissioned by God. Abraham, you know the story. Abraham and Sarah of old age have no children. They begin a promise. Promise the Lord you're going to have a son, you're going to have a child. He's going to be great. And so Moses has this, and you know they begin to wonder and question, is it ever going to happen? They're of old age. Sarah begins to question. She comes up with a plan because she wants to help God out. I'm going to say it in a way my mother would not be happy with me. God don't need no help. God doesn't need your help. If God said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, he may do it through you, but it's still him who's doing it, not you. She's going to help out and, and made a mess of things. But then after that period of time, she has a child. Praise God. They're rejoicing and they're, they're, they're loving their son and, and, and the destiny that God has called him to. And it's glorious and wonderful. And then all of a sudden, one day God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to kill your boy. The unthinkable. The unthinkable. Now, anybody who knows God knows that God is not a God of death. God is a God of life. In, that, in fact, Jehovah means full of life. So this is, this is I'm, I'm sure if it were me, I would say, excuse me, God, what did you say? Would you mind writing that down? Can we sign a contract? But, but, but Abraham heard the voice of God, and the Bible says Abraham knew God. He knew God. He knew God's nature. He, he, he knew who God was. And so as they're journeying up, the, the, the um, I was going to say the ushers, the, the servants were going up with them to a point where Abraham says no more. And this is what he says. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there 
And then listen to this. We will worship and then we will come back to you. He knew God. He knew God. He knew that God was not going to require the death of his son or, as the New Testament tells us, believes that he could raise his son from the dead. He had confidence in God. He trusted God more than he trusted himself. You stay here. The boy and I, we're going to go up to that mountain with the Lord. We're going to commune with him. We're going to fellowship with him. We're going to hear his voice, and then we're both going to come back down to you. That's the faith of Abraham. And so Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, and placed it on his son Isaac. Put the burden on Isaac. Where was the burden of sin placed? On Jesus. In this analogy and comparison between Isaac and Jesus, Isaac was the only begotten firstborn son of Abraham. Jesus, the only begotten son of the Father. On the third day, Moses, or excuse me, Abraham looks up and sees that place, puts the burden, and, and the Bible goes on to say, and he had the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went together, verse 7 says, and this is interesting, God has a sense of humor. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Get this in mind. He's, he knows what they're going up there to do. They're going up to make a sacrifice. Isaac knows this. He knows He's been told, his father told him, you're going with me, we're going up to the mountain, we're going to fellowship with God, and then we're going to have a sacrifice. He's carrying the wood, he's carrying the burden. His father's carrying the knife, the object of his death, and the fire, the object of his purification. He's carrying that, and Isaac's carrying the wood, and all of a sudden it dawns on Isaac. He's looking around. Well, we got the wood, it's on my back. He's got the knife and the fire. Hey, Dad, by the way, Where's the sacrifice? That'd be my question, too. Where's the sacrifice that we're going to offer to the Lord? Where is it? We've, we forgot the sacrifice. <laughs> I guess we got to go back down, Dad, and get the sacrifice. No. And, and, and Abraham's response is this. Abraham answered, verse 8, God himself will provide the lamb for burnt offering, my son. You see, Abraham knew God. He knew God. Do you know God? Do you have that trust in God? You see, we, we struggle sometimes with trusting God to pay our tithes. We, we struggle sometimes in giving offerings. We, we struggle sometimes in serving. We struggle sometimes in telling somebody about Jesus. We struggle sometimes to pray. We struggle sometimes to read the word. But Abraham knew his God. God himself he didn't say, well, we'll find one. God himself, God's interaction into our life will provide what we need for this offering. God himself, not, interesting the word, and I don't think God wastes words in the Bible. God himself will provide the lamb for burnt offering. And the two of them went together, and when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. The burden was lifted from Isaac's back. But then he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. We talk a lot about the faith of Abraham. What about the faith of Isaac? Now, now if there was a race between, a foot race between Isaac and Abraham, who do you think would win that race? If a fight broke out between Isaac and Abraham, who do you think would win that fight? Abraham, excuse me, Isaac had to allow himself to be tied up. Isaac didn't place himself on the altar. Abraham placed himself. And I suspect Isaac probably helped him a little bit. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you about me. Tell you about me. If my dad came at me with a knife, <laughs> we would have a conversation right there. If my dad said to me, he's got this rope, and he says to me, I'm going to tie you up, son. You're going to do what? I'm, well, I'm going to tie you up. And for what purpose? Well, because I'm going to put you up here on the altar. Say again? I'm going to put you up here on the altar. And what are you going to do after that? 
I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you in the natural, I'm going to tell you exactly what I would do. I'd be coming down that mountain. And I would go down the mountain a whole lot faster than we came up that mountain. And when I got down the mountain, I'd say, hey, there's something wrong with my dad. We, we, need, to, we need to call the ambulance right away. Something wrong with that man. But, but. Isaac had to allow himself to be bound. He didn't have to be. He could have run away. He could have fought and would have won. He knew he could beat his dad, but he didn't. Can I tell you why? I think for two reasons. Number one, he honored his father. What an honor that is. But number two, he either trusted his dad or he trusted God. And I believe he trusted God because his dad had told him God himself will provide the, the lamb for sacrifice. And so, and, well, let's read on. And that's about as far as we're going to get this morning. Um, he bound his son, his Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And, and then, he's talking about Abraham, Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now, can I just stop here and say, he was waiting for that call. He was waiting for that call. As a, as a servant of God is doing what God's called him to be, do and, 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 and live as God has called him to live and all of the adversity of life is coming against all of the uh, demons of, of hell are coming against you or so it feels and, and you're just you're doing God's will and you're doing God's purpose and you're just waiting for God's voice to come out if I can just hear God's voice I can do this if I can just feel or sense God's presence I can do this I need something I believe Abraham's ear was really attentive that day, that moment, to hear the call of God. Abraham. And what's interesting is the angel called twice. How many of you know he probably didn't need to call twice? One word would have been enough. Abraham. Abraham. And his response is, here I am. I'm right here doing what you told me to do. I'm, I'm honoring your word step by step. I'm obeying the very intricacies of everything you've asked me to do, even to a point of taking the life of my son. And the angel said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now can I tell you what I think the angel was saying? I don't think he was saying, now I know what you would do, because I think God, I don't think, I know God would already know what Abraham would do. This was a revelation to Abraham, and perhaps even a revelation to Isaac. You can do what I ask you to do. You can take the steps that I ask you to take. You will obey me, Abraham, and maybe more importantly as Isaac, you, you kind of feel or sense as though Isaac is kind of not even a player in this, but he's a major part of this story. In fact, could be he's the most intricate part. We know, the, we know the faith of Abraham, but the faith of Isaac that would allow all of this to take place when he didn't have to make it, let it happen. To Abraham, Abraham, you will follow me. You will be directed by me. You've learned the lessons, and you can do what I ask you to do. But oh, the lesson that Isaac learned. My life was about to end. I submitted my life to my father as a, as a, as a son would, would, would honor his father and he, he was going to kill me, the unthinkable thing. And yet God interceded. And after these words, verse 13 says, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. And he went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now understand what had to happen. I don't know that that ram was in the thicket or would even have been in the thicket had Abraham not been willing to sacrifice his son. I don't think that ram was there. This is my theology. I don't think that, was ram, that ram was even there, even existed until he raised that knife and God put that ram there because there's an answer. God has an answer to death and it's life. And the Bible says, listen to this, the Bible says that Abraham took that ram and he sacrificed it, which also means that he had to take Isaac off of the altar, unbind his hands, so that Isaac could be a participant in the sacrifice that was before to be him. Don't you know he had a greater appreciation for the compassion of God and the voice of God? Don't you know that from that moment forward, he was always listening for that voice, Abraham. Only not Abraham, Isaac. 
Isaac. You see, when you have an encounter with God, it will change you forever. When you have tasted and you have seen that the Lord is good, you have an appetite for more and more and more of God. When you've seen the miraculous hand of God intercede on your behalf, whatever your need is, then you, you can raise your expectations because you have seen the hand of God. And now you walk a different stride. Now your heart beats a different beat. Now your voice sings a new song. And verse 14, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And so to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, in the place where God abides, it will be provided. For you, you may not be sacrificing your child. In fact, if you are, you need to let us know because we need to get you some help. (laughs) But there are other kind of sacrifices too. There are other things that God asks us or calls us to do that we consider impossible. I can't do that. That's not possible. That's not even the realm of possibility. And yet if God asks you to do it, God is going to be with you through the entire process. And see, what Abraham said is, my son and I will be back. After we've been to the place of God, after we've been to the mountain, after we've been into the presence of God, we will come down from this mountain and we'll be with you again. I want you to know this morning, God is with you. Whatever you're facing, whatever crisis, whatever sacrifice you have been called to make, God is with you. And God himself will provide for you. I can experience, I can testify this morning that there are many times that God has provided for me, sometimes miraculously. Our God is God of miracles. But sometimes the miracles happen in ordinary ways too. Sometimes the miracles happen and we don't even recognize that they're miracles. We don't even recognize the hand of God. But oh, when you hear the voice of God, Abraham, and you know something is about to happen. Something is about to happen. I encourage you, make your confession this morning, God himself will provide for me. If you are called to sacrifice your will, called to sacrifice your desires, called to sacrifice your finances, called to sacrifice anything, if you're called to sacrifice, trust in God. And you'll hear that clarion call. Son, daughter, he may say, I receive that sacrifice. Or he may say, I've got something better. I've got something greater in your life. God himself, Jehovah, the one who brings life, if he sees it, he will provide. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we glorify you today and thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for all that you have done in our lives, for all that you are to us. You are a God. In the Greek, Jehovah means the Lord will see to it. Jehovah Jireh in the Hebrew means the Lord will provide. So Father, from that we glean this. If you see, and the Bible says you watch over us, your eyes are always attentive. The Bible declares, Heavenly Father, that you're watching over us as a father watches over his children. That if you see our need, Lord God, you will provide. Like Abraham, he had faith. Trust you. Trust you. You promised you'd give him a son. You gave him a son. You're not going to take him away. Father, I pray for each and every one of us in this, here this morning that we would be willing to have faith like Abraham and faith like Isaac. That we would be willing to be a sacrifice. That we would be willing to sacrifice our will, our wants, our desires, willing to sacrifice our future for what you have called us to do, knowing, Heavenly Father, that even in that sacrifice, you will provide. There are those in the sanctuary this morning that are going through difficult times. There are those, Heavenly Father, that feel as though they've been sacrificing for a long, long time and they're ready to come down off that mountain now. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that as they come, they will not come. I see Abraham and Isaac coming down that mountain, singing the praises of God, glorifying the majesty of a Heavenly Father that would breathe life. And so as we come down that mountain, Father, I pray that we will have that song of joy as well. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, a most important question the question of, of your destiny. A question of who you are and where you are. A question of whether or not you trust God. You see, God loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. There's nothing God would ever ask me to sacrifice or give up that He doesn't have something better for me. And how often we hold on to the things that we own or have 
or our identity. We hold on to it so tight because it's comfortable, it's security. And there are many times where God says, lay it down, lay it down. And, and we're afraid to lay it down because we don't know what comes next. But know this, like Abraham trusted God, you can trust God. That whatever he would ask you to sacrifice or to give up or lay down, he has something better for you. If you're here this morning and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's what this story is all about. The third day, the burden, the only son, the resurrection as it were. This story is to tell you that God loves you and that God has a plan for your life, every one of us. To those of us that we feel that our life is the worst that has ever been lived, that we have failed so miserably, we look at Moses and see that God never gave up on Moses. When we've been given a word and we're not sure that we'll be able to fulfill that, like Abraham, yet trust God and do what God asks us to do, God will always come through. If you're here this morning and you've lost your way, if you're here this morning and you're a prodigal, you once loved God, you once served God, you, you knew the present, you know God, but circumstances invaded your life and things have changed and you've walked away from God. It's time to come home. It's time to come home. And for those that are looking for something that you've never found, never found it in church, never found it in religion, never found it in things of the world, you, you've looked for something to satisfy, something to live for, I'm here to tell you, Jesus will give you life. His name is Jehovah. He is the life giver. And if you're willing just to accept the life he has for you, knowing this, that it's good. After he created everything, Jesus, or Father, looked at it and he said, it is good. And so I'm going to ask this morning, if you're here, a prodigal, someone who's lost, someone who's lost their way, if you're here this morning and you want to be forgiven of sin, or, or you're at a point in your life where you just declare, I need help. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I'm lost. I want to tell you, Jesus has found you today. And if you're here and you want to make that confession of faith, I, I want to pray with you. I, I want to pray with you. And so I'd ask if you desire to make that confession of faith, if you desire to have life, if you want a new beginning in life, I want to invite you, just if you just lift your hand and wave at me, I'm not going to ask you to move, but I want to, I want to be able to pray with you. If, if you want to be forgiven of sin, just raise your hand and wave at me. Let, let, let this pastor pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just wave at me. I don't want to miss you. Thank you. Thank you. A wave of the hand so that I recognize you. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you. See, this is the best decision that you can make. You're making a decision to trust God, and He's trustworthy. You're, you're making a decision for a, a new beginning, not a new chapter in an old book, but a brand new book, brand new beginning. The Bible says the old is gone. You see, God can do what you can't do. God can do what no one can do, give you a new beginning, born again, as if you were a child being born new. One more time, anybody else who's not raised their hand and say, Pastor, I, I need help. I need Jesus, God in my life. Would you just lift your hand, wave at me to join these who have already said so? Thank you. Praise God. We're going to pray. Thank you. We're going to pray. And I want all of us to pray together. Some of you prayed this prayer a long, long time ago, and you would confess, you would testify God has been faithful to you over the years. Those, some of you have just made a confession to serve the Lord, live for God for just a few days, and you would confess in these few days, God has been faithful. So I want all of us to pray together in agreement with these who have raised their hand. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's all pray. Join with me. Heavenly Father, today, December the 8th, 2019, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of every wrong I've ever done in life. Forgive me of every mistake I've ever made. Forgive me of the harm that I've caused to others and the harm I've caused to myself. I ask you today, Father, change my life. Do for me and in me what I could not do for myself. I confess, I witness, I declare, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is my Savior. He took on his back all of the wood burdens and sin of my life. And he died for me. But he arose from the dead for me 
so that I can say today, having asked you to forgive me, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. And you are changing my life. So that today I can say, I will never be the same again. And I can declare, I am a child of God. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you give the Lord a praise offering here today? Hallelujah! The Bible says that when even one makes a confession of faith, when even one commits their life, all of heaven rejoices. Can you imagine what heaven is doing right now? That's the celebration of the decision that you've made today. And I want you to know, too, that we walk with you. You're not alone in this journey. This is not the end, by the way. This is just the beginning of a life where God says, I'm going to be with you every day, and I'm going to help change your life. I'm going to transform your life. I'm going to give you, I am Jehovah, the God of life, and I'm going to give you a life worth living. And we will walk with you as well every day, every day. In fact, we have a gift that we want to give you in honor of your commitment to the Lord. It's not any big deal, really, but it's just a, just a rock. You see, Abraham built an altar. And on that altar, he was going to put his son, but ultimately put a ram, a sacrifice. This, that altar became a memorial, a reminder. And so this rock is nothing more than a rock, but it, it is a reminder, a memorial to you and to anybody who sees it of what God has done in your life today. And as you gaze upon it, it, put it on your desk or on your dresser or on your refrigerator, wherever you look most, as you see it, it reminds you, I made a confession of faith. God is my father today. My life has changed. A constant reminder of what God desires to do in your life and the life that he desires to give to you. But not only that, it may be a reminder to somebody else as well. And they look at that rock. Why well, you got a rock on your refrigerator? Why well, you got a rock on your desk? Well, let me tell you, what Jesus did in my life. Let me tell you, I was, I was lost. That, whatever word you want to use, but the essence of it is, Jesus changed my life. God changed my life. And if he changed my life, he can change your life too. A testimony, a witness of what God can do. And if you, you come, we have this, and we'll put the date on it so that you'll have it with you, and it'll be a reminder to you and to others. But also, we want to give you a, a, a small little piece of paper that talks to you about your new relationship with Jesus. It's not a membership card. It's just to remind you of, what, of who you are and what God desires for your life. And also to let you know that we have a class. 